Hi, everybody. It's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Thanks for joining me at this strange plant-based hour time. Uh, we usually, as you know, are live on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, but this has been a crazy week. Everyone's back from New York from Plant-Based World Expo. My next podcast is going to talk about the Plant-Based World Expo because I want to juxtapose it with next week's conference, which is the Good, Good Food Institute Conference. I'll be in San Francisco hosting a roundtable on that one, very much like I did for Plant-Based World Expo. The, the roundtable at the GF, uh, GFI, concert, GFI um, uh, conference will be Path to Profitability, What Companies Need to Know Before They IPO for the Public Markets to Take Them Seriously, to Value Them Correctly. What did, in fact, happen to Beyond Meat and Oatly? Will they return? What kind of public markets are we looking at for the plant-based innovation sector? So if you're going to the Good Food Conference, come find me. I will have a roundtable on the Wednesday, September 20th. Uh, so during lunch hours, so come find me. There's another thing that I'd like to mention before we get into my guest today, and that is my great friends, whom I really, really appreciate. Um over at uh, North Carolina Innovation Food Lab. They are headed up by Bill Amidas, probably one of the smartest people in the world. He is having a food tech pitch conference and it's October 10th and you can register here. So hopefully, I'm sorry for the people on podcast. Um, you can come find me on LinkedIn to get the information. But the people watching on audio and video on LinkedIn, you can see the QR code. You can register here. And uh, there's a great lineup on the first day, Lee Cooper of Barbecue. I'm a very big fan of the North Carolina Food Innovation Lab. He's going to be the keynote speaker. And then there'll be pitch sessions for startups. And you can win prizes of things like up to three hours of free consultation from the North Carolina Food Innovation Lab. It's valued at $1,000. Um, you can also have a full free day access to the lab and production environment. That's a $5,000 dollar value. And then if you're a beverage company, you can win $500. So you can go to uh, go.ncsu.edu forward slash food innovation CFIL. And you have to do that before September 29th to register the second day of the event, which is October 11th. It's going to be keynote Andrew Ive. Of course, he's been on this show, uh, Andrew Ive of Big Idea Ventures. He's going to talk about the day of partnerships and how North Carolina Food Innovation Lab partners with uh, startups. So again, you can go to go.ncsu.edu forward slash food innovation NCFIL. Want to make sure I get that right. Go.ncsu.edu forward slash food innovation NCFL North Carolina Food Innovation Lab, NCFIL. Okay, everybody. So um, I wanted to make sure that you had that information. Now, as I get right to our um, uh, guest today, so many of us talk about sustainability. Our sector has great sustainability numbers. I know from uh, working at VegTech, we are constantly talking about how all of the companies in our ETF are um, not creating emissions. So we indeed avoid emissions and therefore we're carbon neutral without buying credits. No need to make offsets if you're not making the emissions. So through emissions avoidance, it's a very powerful tool to have great sustainability numbers. Now, if you are working in, let's say, the LinkedIn cafeteria, then you get to turn in great sustainability numbers to your bosses and your department is meeting the sustainability goals. So these kinds of things going through corporate and strategic partner uh, minds about how to best get sustainability numbers. Many of them haven't even started on their 2030 goals. So uh, what does it look like to be on your 2030 goal trajectory? I want to bring in my guest today, who is the Director of Innovation, Thierry Duvanel from Bueller Group, which they've long been on this podcast, although Thierry never has been, uh, and talking about sustainability at Bueller and how they're really seeing the entire supply chain scopes, one, two, and three, impacted by the uh, supply chain partners like Bueller who are invested in helping to create plant-based proteins. Thierry, thanks for being on the Plant-Based Business Hour today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. 
So I think of Bueller really as a leader here. Uh, we know that the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, is about to come down in October with a decision to mandate scopes one, two, maybe even scope three emissions for every publicly traded company. Now, Bueller is not a publicly traded company, but you take your scopes one, two, and three uh, very seriously. We're going to walk through what that kind of looks like for Bueller. But before we do that, do you have anything that you'd like to say about scopes one, two, and three? I know one of the scopes is a little bit more important than the others. Indeed. So maybe just to put things in context, first, I have to very briefly remind what, what Builder is and what we do. So mm, we, we are a, uh, we're a company out of Switzerland, but we're global. Uh, and since 160 years, 163 actually, we, uh, we manufacture and design uh, food processing equipment for the industry for pretty much anything plant-based. And it's very trendy to say that, but we've been doing that for over a century. So we, we provide the uh, equipment that is needed to transform and process uh, all the uh, cereals, the grains, uh, pulses, legumes, but also maize, corn, depending where you are, you would call it differently, rice. And then the more value added uh, grains like coffee, coffee cocoa, uh, uh all the nuts and 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 so on and seeds so um we're very much at the at the heart of this question because as everyone knows about a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions are related to agriculture and and, and therefore food um mm -hmm. we we started back in 2016 actually seriously um by stating publicly that we would uh, we would take action to lower by 30% the uh, uh, use of energy, the mm -hmm. addition of waste and water in the value chains of our customers. Quite honestly, uh, we didn't know really what we were doing at the time. Um, and you know, I have to remind that it, it was before uh, the greenhouse gas protocol was really widely known and, and understood and, and anyone was actually speaking about scopes one, two and three. So this is how it started. Um, and, uh, and we've been then uh, doing our, our homework, if I can say, uh, and, and starting uh, looking, at, looking at this. For us, the, the rule of the game as, as Builder is, uh, is scope three downstream. But I guess mm -hmm. we'll talk about that in more detail. Yes, we will get to that in more detail. Let me ask you, um, before we dive into the specifics, what prompted Bueller in 2016 when there really was no pressure to do so? Or if there was, it was mild pressure. What prompted Bueller to get out ahead of this? Well, it, it's, um, I think it, it was known since before 2016 that the, uh, the, the biggest contributor to, to greenhouse gas emissions is agriculture, as we said, and, and, and food. And, and we've been very, I have to say, successful in this business for, for years. Uh, now, being successful is not necessarily uh, the best place to be uh, because you are always seen as the, as the leader and, and, and the one on the forefront. So we have to also take actions uh, and, uh, and, and be the, the best demonstrator of, of what we can do in that space. Um, so we've, we've looked at the evolution uh, that are coming in the, uh, in the food system in general, uh, being less reliant on animal proteins, uh, which speaks very much in favor of what we do, uh, but also looking at the, uh, the big promise of, uh, of bioprocessing and, and uh, precision fermentation. And so we believe that there is a, there's a strong need to revisit uh, the, uh, the way we produce uh, food and um, and this has been driving very much our introspection, if I can say, uh, are also uh, on uh, on that topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, I used to work for the Kellogg Company. I was brand manager for Special K and Frosted Mini Weights. And we used to always say it's Special K because there's was always some government regulation coming down on labeling or nutrition facts or what have you. We always used to say there's a lot of equity in being first and that there was no point in dragging our heels and being last because government was going to change whatever government wanted to change. And we either had the opportunity to take the equity to lead out in front on any new nutrition label or whatever it was at the time, 
or we would miss that opportunity. So I like to see Bueller out in front and we're going to get into some of the details here of just how you've done it because it is overwhelming in a way. And, um, you know, maybe it's easier. I'm not sure about this. I'd love your perspective before we get into the deck. Maybe it's easier for a startup because they don't have to retrofit. They can just start from a clean slate and do the right thing. Would you say that to the entrepreneurs listening today? Oh, absolutely. And I'll get back to that in, in more details, maybe after we have detailed a little bit the, uh, yeah. the context. But uh, Builder is very engaged in, um, in a startup accelerator called Mass Challenge. Full disclosure, I used to run Mass Challenge in Europe, so it's close to my heart. Um, but this year, we have actually introduced um, a model that can be used by any startup taking part to the Mass Challenge program to actually uh, have a much better quantification and understanding of their um, carbon footprint or CO2e equivalent, as we say. Um, and uh, I'm, I'd be happy to give more details on that, but you can go online and, and, and find it. Okay, so uh, it is open to the public, not just... It is, it is open to the public, uh, but it's also a strong uh, incentive for, for startups to uh, pay attention to what Mass Challenge is doing, a little bit of advertisement here, uh, because uh, we, we've we been <clears throat> positioning the, the, uh, the startup acceleration program very strongly on food, uh, food systems and, and food tech, but then we needed to have a tool in order to make sure that we would support and engage with really the, the front runners, the one who have something special. Uh, and the only way to do that is uh, is really to quantify and understand what they do. So we've run uh, such models on, on any plant-based meat, plant-based dairy, fermentation, cultivation, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite effective to understand from the very first day, as you say, as a startup, uh, where your where your path leads to. So quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to to seeing some some numbers and then circling back on that because probably the the question in everyone's mind is, but how do I afford it? Particularly in this uh, venture capital lacking situation that we're in right now. Let me give us some room here and some space. Um, okay, I am capable of uh, going through the slides for you, but I'm basically going to let Thierry take it away and tell us about Bueller's uh, sustainability models and trajectory and successful results. Thank you. So you're in charge. Oh, of I'm a, yes, I'm in the wrong. So sorry, everyone. I, I am the produce, you know, I'm the backstage tech person as well as uh, the front page host. So sorry, everybody. But here we are in the beginning of the sustainability at Bueller presentation. You have all the jobs. OK, I I, I already introduced Bueller uh, briefly. So uh, I, something I didn't mention is that although we talk about plant based food here, but uh, about 20 percent of our activity is in non food. Um, it's around materials transformation for the mobility and automotive sector, which is quite interesting because from a sustainability perspective, we address two big issues, which are uh, what we eat and how we move around. Um, so, but I, I will focus on more on the, on the food side. So mm -hmm. I guess we can jump maybe to the, to the next slide. Um, this is summarizing a little bit how we uh, uh, undertake these projects at Builder. We we decided, and that's also probably a luxury of not being listed. As you said, we are we are not a, a public company. We are 100% owned by the fifth generation of the family builder. But we undertake every project, any new innovation, under the light of three guiding principles. Um, yes, we have the economy. Uh, of course, we need to uh, make uh, sure that the company grows uh, and uh, and uh, and have let's say, a, a sustainable, profitable future. Um, so this is certainly one, one guiding principle, but we have added very uh, actively since the uh, uh, probably last uh, six to seven years, two other dimensions which are on one side nature, which speaks very much into sustainability, but not only, and uh, humanity. Uh, and humanity is also related to this, one of the mission of the company is to provide the uh, food manufacturers with the best environment so that they can provide affordable nutrition to uh, the population. Um, and with this comes education, job creation, and also diversity and inclusion. 
So you may think, okay, this is the usual kind of corporate chit chat, um, but we live we live these values. Uh, the company is thirteen thousand people around the world. It's a big family, quite big, but these three guiding principles are known by everyone. So if you go to the next slide. Um, Speaking of sustainability, these are the, the type of commitments and, and bold statement that you would find in, in, in some companies, not all, unfortunately, but uh, uh, we're working on that. So we have, we have made two main uh, uh, commitments. One is uh, what you see on the lower left corner, which is um, minus 50% or 50% reduction mm -hmm. in waste, energy and water in our customer's value chain. And I'll get back to that because this is very important uh, to understand that we have a huge impact on the food manufacturers of the world by supplying them technology. We started in 2016 by saying minus 30%. We revised that in 2019. And, and this was also our pathway in, in, in learning all about that. Um, but this is the external impact we can we can uh, generate, and we need also to do our own uh, homework. And this is what you see more in the middle, which is the focus of minus sixty or sixty percent reduction. Um, we we've publicly committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our own operations uh, by twenty thirty by sixty percent. And and there's always a question: why not hundred percent? Then We'll see that the, the numbers are actually quite uh, speaking by themselves, but this is speaking about scope one and two. So here we go. We need to introduce a bit more what the greenhouse gas protocol is about. And, and for that, maybe you can jump to the next slide. Yes, I, uh, I would like to just interject really quickly here for the audience. Oh. So, you know, I think a lot of us are thinking, oh, I'm going to have to do an LCA and, you know, reduce carbon numbers or at least do some kind of analysis so I can promote my own numbers. And it is about your numbers. It is about the consumer packaged goods at the end of the line and the sustainability numbers they can have. You see that Oatly does this on their packaging. It's quite powerful. But it's also the entire supply chain up and down. So when you look at a partner like Bueller, you see that they're focused on their own footprint, but they're focused on cleaning up the footprint of the world, if I may say, the world being their clients, but they're quite large and they make a lot of uh, machinery to produce food for many companies. So I'll say the world. They're looking at cleaning up that supply chain. And so that 50% number to me, I give my own reaction to you, is very impressive I'm it's very ambitious it's yeah. impressive and and this is something that can only be understood when you look at the immense uh amount of uh both impact lever that we have in scope three downstream so in in by supplying the manufacturing equipment to the food industry um so uh, and I, I'm switching, but I'll just say one more thing. And what this slide says, and Thierry's going to take you through it all, but I'm, I'm mildly hopeful, if you will, that companies see through sustainability how they interact and work together and that because it's it's not possible to have real impact unless we're all focused on helping each other up and down the supply chain. And so we see how interwoven we all are and that so the solution can only come from interweaving well together, working well together. And I'm hopeful that that forces transparency between partners up and down the supply chain and that that creates real understanding in the marketplace because we're all working together. And so it's not one or two companies fixing their own numbers. It's how we fix the entire supply chain. Thierry, just correct me if I've got that wrong. No, indeed. Absolutely. And, and the first step for that is to have numbers. It yes. sounds very much an engineering approach, but you, you need to be able to have some matter to touch and and uh, and manipulate in order to to understand what we talk about. So sorry for the slide, which is quite complicated, but um, hopefully I will be able to decipher that and, and, and explain. So this, the, the greenhouse gas protocol has now um, been around for, uh, for, for a few years and it's uh, it's, it's proposing, it's suggesting a model which is quite simple, but that fits any industry and that really is useful for comparing and 
uh, understanding amongst different industries, amongst different players within an industry, how we go and how we can interact and and work together on that on that ambitious goal. So, at the center, you have scopes one and two, um, which are about the greenhouse emissions that are generated within an operation unit. So within a factory or within an organization, a company. Scope one is the direct emissions. That's everything which is related to the activities of the company itself. And scope two is indirect. It's all the carbon or greenhouse gas, which is hidden behind the essentially use of electricity, steam, heating, all the energies that are required to run that business. This is the, let's say, the, the footprint of the company itself or the organization itself. Mm. By the way, I talk, we talk about greenhouse gases and you see uh, uh, this acronym CO2E. Um, greenhouse gases are, are multiple. We talk about carbon oxide, carbon dioxide, so it's CO2, but there's others such as uh, nitrous oxide, such as methane and others. They don't all have all these gases come from the same sources. They don't all have uh, the same impact. In order to make things comparable and measurable, we have decided to introduce, not we as builder, the uh, 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 industry has decided to go on a, on a, a unique energy, uh, um, sorry, um, carbon uh, measurement unit, which is CO2 equivalent. So we, we bring back any greenhouse gas to the equivalent it would have if it were CO2. So it's a bit complicated, but in the end, it allows us to speak about one unit with one unit about any greenhouse gas emission. Yeah. Um, if I may just say, we talk about this a lot, folks, on the show. So methane, we know one of the more nefarious gases. It is, I believe, 80 times. I don't want to get the numbers wrong, but it's in, it's much more powerful at destroying, if you will, than carbon, um, than CO2 but it has a shorter lifespan. So in that way, if you manipulate methane, you can have impact in the shorter term than you would have, let's say, carbon, which will hang out in the atmosphere much longer. This just to show you the importance of CO2 equivalency, because the gases have different impacts, have different lifespans, have different potencies, et cetera. So that's what Thierry is talking about. Thank you for translating this. Absolutely. Yeah. So scope one and two are about our operation. Uh, or an operation in particular. Now, we know that there is um, emissions upstreams and upstream and downstream. Uh, and, and this is what scope three is about. Scope three is about measuring what is on the upstream part, all the greenhouse gas hidden again in the purchase goods and all the logistics. So think of all the raw materials that whatever the industry is about, all the raw materials, all the inputs that are needed in order to provide either a service or uh, a product. And then you have on the downstream, which is on the right side of the, of the slide here, the use of the products that the industry is, is, is providing. Uh, it can be uh, the use in terms of food, so eating, way, uh, uh, generating waste, hopefully not too much, but it could be also the use of the equipment. Mm -hmm. So these three families, scope one and two grouped together in the middle, and then scope three upstream, scope three downstream, form a picture that any industry can build, any unit, any industrial environment can build in order to have a understanding of what are the greenhouse gas emissions and therefore having an understanding of where we should act. So the first step that we took as builder was to was to measure this, and and you have numbers here. There's methods behind, and we have developed those. Uh, these these are about life cycle analysis, but it's also about uh, a model that we have developed over the years that is now used as a service as well for our customers. So, oh. without getting into too much details. Uh, scopes one and two for us is about 77,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. It's always a bit hard to understand what it means, how much does it represent. So it's it's important more to, things, to, to think of these numbers in relation to another. 
So 77,000 tons in the middle. Now, if you look at what we have on the left part, it's 10 times more, right? 772,000 tons. This is all the carbon, which is or the carbon equivalent, which is hidden in the goods that we buy, the raw materials that we buy and all the logistics, which is involved in there. What does it mean? We manufacture the processing equipment for the food industry. Mm -hmm. we, we manufacture wheat mills, extruders for plant-based meats, uh, dryers, uh, optical sorters, and all the equipment that is required to produce wheat, to produce biscuits, to produce plant-based meats, to produce uh, plant-based dairy and, and, and others. So all the metal, if you like, and all the technologies that are required to build these equipments, it's what is hidden or what is producing the 772,000 ton, tons on mm -hmm. the left. Mm -hmm. Now, if we shift our, our view on what is on the right, you see a massive number. And it's an estimation because it's very hard to be uh, more precise at that level. That's the scope three downstream which is the carbon used or hidden or emitted when using the product. Mm -hmm. so for us, we sell these equipment that I described before to the food industry, to the big food manufacturers of the world. And they use these equipment with all the energy, the use of water and the waste they can generate day in and day out to produce the food. So this is a picture of what Bure does and what a, an equipment manufacturer does. What is important is now to realize that our scope three is actually the scope one and two of our customers. Aha, uh -huh. right. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of a shift if sure. we were to, to depict what we have here for us, the 42 million tons that we have is actually summing up the scopes one and two of all the food manufacturers around the world. I don't want to cite any name here, yeah. but you, you know them. All the CPGs, all yeah. the big ingredient manufacturers. The big ones. Yeah. Up, the big ones and the small ones too. They rely on our equipment. And by running it, they actually have a scope one and two, which is more or less high depending on the efficiency of this equipment. Yeah. Sorry. Let me just jump in a second for the people listening on audio, because I want to um, paint this picture for them as well as direct them to this video that you can find on YouTube or on ElizabethAlfano.com or on LinkedIn, because you're going to really, or I can send you the deck just if that's okay, Thierry, can I send sure. people to that? Yeah. Okay. So find me on LinkedIn because I want you to see this deck, but I just want to reiterate some of the numbers. So for scope three, so upstream from Bueller, which is a food processing, uh, equipment manufacturer, uh, upstream and downstream, you're looking at approximately, I'm doing the math, 43 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Their own scopes one and two are about 77,000 as compared to 43 million. So you see, you will not impact climate change if you don't address scope three. That's the harder number to get, I believe. Till you can tell me, but my understanding is that's the harder number to get. Therefore, for maybe some of the small of you, small entrepreneurs of you, maybe that's the more expensive number to get. But it is kind of meaningless, which is why I'm, we keep writing to the SEC, asking them to demand scope three, at least in time. It's kind of meaningless unless you look at scope three up and down the beyond your own business, but up and down. This is why we're all interrelated. Thierry, do I have that right? Absolutely. Scope three is, is really the, uh, the most important one, not only by numbers, but by consideration. Um, but it's also important to underline that it depends on the business model. Mm, so fair enough. Um, just to give uh, an idea, um, we have, as you calculated, about 43 million tons of global all scopes, um, carbon uh, equivalent or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and to make uh, that in relationship with our revenue, which is about three and a half billion uh, US dollars, um, if we were to calculate the same uh, ratio, so to say, for an average CPG, 
Mm. We have a scope three downstream, which is way bigger than the average food producer. And why so? It's because the scope three downstream of the food producers, our customers, is right. only about the waste that they generate and the use of the products. Their big scope is on one and two because of the energy which is used by running the equipment and it's scope three upstream for all the carbon which is hidden in the raw material. So and it's the transportation, no? And the transportation as well. But uh, for, for food products, the immense majority, unless we consider some very specific processes, the immense majority is always in the raw material itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, it, it's just uh, here illustrating that having these numbers is important because it, it shows where we should put attention and where, where we should really act first. Mm -hmm. So for us, I mean, when you've, if, if you are a little bit in engineering or, or in just doing a little bit of math, when you see 77,000, and 42 million. Oh my gosh. Where mm -hmm. do I put my attention first? What do yeah. I do first? Where, will yeah. I, where, where do we have an impact? I think yeah. that's clear to say it's scope three downstream for mm -hmm. us. Um, so this is where we, we are really uh, emphasizing and, and putting all the effort. Having said that, we wouldn't be credible. We wouldn't have any um, lever also with regards to our customers if we weren't doing our own work and, and, and working on our side. So we have taken action uh, and serious actions to lower scopes one and two. And the commitment we've made is to lower that by 60% by 2030. But then it's the 50% number for your scopes three. Am I understanding that correctly? Oh, the 50% for scope three is the, the important one. And this is where we have, um, we have started uh, now a few years ago, uh, an immense um, effort to really understand the use of our technologies along the value chain so that we can precisely identify per technology unit where is the emission and work on those in order to lower down in order to make a dent on these 42 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so for those companies that may be already work with Bueller and Bueller, as we talked about, does something called the startup mass challenge. So they do work with startups, even if you are not um, Unilever, they <laughs> work with Anymore, startups. No. So um, maybe is, is this something that Bueller promotes? Do, does everyone know that if they're working with Bueller, they might get help in figuring out their scopes one, two, and three, or perhaps you could so figure it out we, together? We're just starting, but that's, that's a, I, I'm using also uh, this occasion to talk about that. So um, first of all, uh, engaging with startups is, is of course, uh, uh, almost a no-brainer. I mean, when you look at the immense opportunity, let's put it positive, uh, of tapping into these 42 million tons. We can't do that by ourselves. Mm. It's far too big as an, as, as an endeavor. Um, the amount of technologies, changes that is required is very important. And even if we, we are engineers by nature uh, and, and we are very much active in that space, we need to engage with the innovators of the world to, to do that. So. We're very actively engaging in different ecosystems around the world with startups. Um, you've mentioned a few that were on, your, on the channel uh, before, and, uh, and we know them well, and they are our friends. And uh, we have a very intense activity with startups. One of these programs being Mass Challenge, where we support companies helping the industry with what are required for, for tapping into this. Uh, and in order to measure it, because the first level is, as we said, quantify, we have developed this model that Mass Challenge is using based on, on our, uh, our framework, so to say, to come up with numbers like that per business. So each startup can go to Mass Challenge and have access to the model. We can also make it available through, uh, through Builder. Uh, and uh, actually do an analysis in order to come up with these numbers and see where we are and where we can act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's powerful. So um, 
Shout out to Nick Manley at Bueller US Marketing. He and I worked uh, together to promote Mass Challenge. Um, I do it every year. So please, we've missed the deadline. You're not going to see it come up for another six months or so. But um, you can go ahead and Google Mass Challenge Bueller, B-U-H-L-E-R, and you'll come up with uh, what happened last year, or I guess it was maybe early this year. Um, And then you can kind of plan and prepare for 2024. Uh, just a, a, a note, maybe Teal, you can clarify if I've got this wrong, but while your customers are major food manufacturers, and so your scope three, your supply chain upstream is their scope one and two, because you are supplying to them. I, I do understand that animal agriculture's big scope uh, is really also scope three, and what they're getting in the raw materials to um, basically grow crops and then feed them to animals. And because of the scale of that, 80 billion animals in animal factories, uh, 80 billion, so that's 10 times more people on earth. Granted, the most of it is chickens, but still, just to give, so you understand like the, you know, we're talking about scopes one, two, and three. So if you're talking about scopes of an animal, you've got the grains that go into feeding them. You've got the cutting down of the trees. And then you've also got all that manure. Where do 80 billion animals go to the bathroom? Well, your food, your, your land and water, you know, they don't have uh, indoor plumbing in, in plush condos. So it's just not treated and goes right into the land and water. Okay. So they've got those kind of considerations. And my understanding to you is that um, their scopes three are pretty uh, damaging. Do I have that right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and another dimension that needs to be taken in account that is not depicted in, in, in this, uh, uh, in this image here is the water depletion. Ah, and, great. Uh, Thank you for bringing it up. Agricultural lands. So mm-hmm. there are actually three dimensions that we need to take in account. That's the CO2 equivalent emission, the greenhouse gas, but it's also the use of water uh, or water depletion and, uh, and the land. And the so land. when you combine these three aspects together, uh, you, have, you have a much better picture of, of where the impact can be. Here we've been talking about greenhouse gas specifically because this is uh, one aspect on which we have been able to uh, to address things mm-hmm. uh, quite uh, quite effectively. Yeah, I'll take maybe, this opportunity. Oh, please go ahead. Sorry. Maybe I can illustrate some of the technologies that we have put in place in order to tap into this scope three. Would you yes. mind going to the to the next slide? So this is about builder where we are. It's not really interesting, but we have uh, activities more related to scope one and two for us. Um, Innovations that that uh, that we can highlight. So uh, in the, in the uh, uh, nut roaster uh, sector, we have uh, worked on the energy efficiency, for instance, uh, that uh, can go up to fifty percent less energy per kilogram of product. So thinking of re- energy uh, capture, waste, heat, reutilization, and capture. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and much better isolation, insulation of the uh, uh, of the uh, um, uh, the devices and the equipment that leads to a fifty percent reduction of scope one and two of our customers. Because again, our scope for nuts. Three is for nuts in that case. Uh, in the middle, it's not related to food, but we have activities, as I said, in uh, automotive and in mobility, and by extension, uh, glass coating. So this is an important one to look at. Uh, how we could help saving energy in the in the context of buildings, for instance. The last one on the right is is very close to our hearts, um, where uh, with plant based meat, uh, we we can actually uh, demonstrate that we have up to twenty times lower CO two equivalent emissions per kilogram compared to beef. And again, this has an impact on scope one and two of our customers, but also the scope three, their scope three as right. a waste generation. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, this concept of emissions avoidance is so powerful. We talk about it all the time at VegTech Invest, the companies we invest in. They're just not making the emissions like here with Bueller, helping plant-based foods, just making fewer emissions. And that emissions avoidance is a really powerful uh, tool. And, and again, when you're looking at emissions avoidance, that would include things like methane that have a shorter lifespan and you can really impact climate change 
when you start playing around with um, reducing methane. And I'll say the reverse, you really won't impact climate change in the time that we need to do it if you don't address the food portion. There's, of course, electric uh, vehicles, alternative energy, alternative building materials, but it, it really won't happen if food isn't a part of that. Oh, absolutely. So these, this is very... Techy. Oh, should I go back? Sorry. That, 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 that's, that's right. I, I was just transitioning to the to the next uh, the next bit. So there, there are there are also ways to address um, emission of greenhouse gas in scope three in our scope three downstream, uh, which is scope one and two for, for our customers. It's interesting to look at doing better with with what we have today, instead of always trying to look at new technologies, new approaches, which is super important. Don't, don't get me wrong, but um, the uh, uh, the greenhouse gases. Uh, are also emitted uh, through waste. Mm -hmm. And when we work on circularity or upcycling of the side streams, we can have a big impact as well. We know that about a third of the food produced worldwide is, is lost or wasted. It's amazing. Uh, and every year we generate more than a billion tons of side streams. I mean by mm -hmm. side streams, everything that is left behind when processing food thanks to or due to the um, the processes that we have developed. And that is most of the time used as feed, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, which promotes, by the way, again, the use of animal proteins in our diets, which is exactly the opposite of what we want to do. Um, and that has the size stream most of the time a high value still, interestingly. So looking at the value that is hidden in these size streams can also uh, work in uh, in the right direction or help us reach uh, reach these goals. Um, the next slide depicts that a little bit uh, from a from a different standpoint, um, and that's the usual illustration of a circular economy mm -hmm. uh, using organic materials as a way to feed some of the processes and uh, and getting to uh, the the the, um, the use of these materials. Um, one aspect that we have been working on uh, a lot is also insects, for instance, uh, the use of insects to uh, provide novel proteins as a source of proteins. It's nothing as in farming. It's sometimes disputed because it's effectively farming animals, uh, although the carbon footprint of insects is way lower than uh, of bigger animals, of course. Uh, and it's also a solution that can be used as a temporary one or transition towards a more sustainable feed solution for cattle and, and animals, because we will not get rid of them overnight, unfortunately. And uh, we need to find solutions in order to prepare the future in that direction, too. I always worry about insects because, according to the United Nations, the top three reasons for the next pandemic, so not the pandemic that we're in now, but it's the intensification of animal farming and, you know, because they're living butt to snout in their own feces. So, of course, when you've got 80 billion animals in that condition, you're going to spread disease as they come in contact with people. And then I, I worry that if we're factory farming bugs to give to factory animals, we're doubling our risk. Actually, we're more than that because the bugs are so small. Uh, we're really exposing ourselves to public health issues. And I, I just worry about that because that seems like a potentially recipe for disaster. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the worries is very valid. Um, you, you need to to remember that we've started talking about industrially farming insects only in the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So we can also embark on this journey, all the learnings that we have had from years of development in other activities of farming. So uh, it's it's no, no surprise that the regulatory environment is very strict for that. Um, it is uh, for once a little bit more open in Europe than in, uh, in North America. Mm -hmm. The FDA is, uh, is a little bit more cautious on that, but it is coming. And uh, being active as builder in, the, in that space, uh, we can tell you that it is under very high and strict control from the genetic standpoint, measuring the drift in, within colonies, um, the uh, level of uh, sanitation in, in these uh, uh, plants is very high. 
Um, so uh, we believe we have invested in this. We believe that it is uh, an important uh, vector for making a dent in this in these 40 million tons uh, that we were talking about as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I could go back to just one slide, I just want to help people hear understanding on audio and also maybe watching on LinkedIn. If you look at that number on the right, the 1 billion ton of side stream, it again helps you understand the scale of what we're talking about. And ultimately, we have 8 billion people on the planet. According to the United Nations, we're going to 10 billion people. So we just can't continue to output these kind of side streams. We're going up 25% in population. Ultimately, we're going to have to create more food that is more nutritious in a shorter amount of time that travels shorter distances using fewer resources while creating less damage. Because we aren't getting more land and we aren't getting more water, but we're getting more people and we don't want more side streams, more one third of food lost or wasted because of these long transportation chains that we have around the world, shipping live animals, for example, from Australia to the Middle East, live pigs from the US to China. And then we ship the grains around the world, shipping soy over to China so that they can feed pigs. It's, it is unsmart. And any other business would clean up its supply chain. It would clean up its cost of goods sold. But, but companies have been allowed to externalize their cost of goods sold, not pay, paying full prices for water, let's say, or, or um, you know, if they're polluting water through animal manure, et cetera, who's cleaning that up? Usually it's taxpayer dollars. So, um, you know, this, this is why when we work together and we bring transparency like Bueller's doing here to the supply chain and really see where all the issues are, that's when you start to clean things up. Okay, that's my... Sorry to interrupt there. That's my uh, two yeah. cents analysis. I'll take you to the next slide. Yeah, so this is just illustrating uh, the, the, the homework we've done in order to uh, revisit our technologies. And this is an ongoing process in order to bit by bit come up with either energy or waste or water use reduction mm -hmm. uh, for the value chains of our customers. Again, go three downstream some illustration, but we have done that over the slide set 70, but actually it's, it's way more at the moment. We take any new innovation, uh, any, sorry, new development or innovation in the company under the light of, of, of these uh, three dimensions. So 50% less energy waste or water. We have uh, the core of the activity of the, of the company, which is uh, milling. So here a, a technology that um, can uh, or saves actually 10% energy use uh, while running a mill. You have to understand that we talk about industrial environments that produce hundreds of tons of wheat 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, any percent of energy saving is really uh, a gold, <laughs> if I can say. Uh, it translates to about 200 tons uh, of CO2 savings per year per mill. So this is uh, this yeah. is uh, interesting Meaningful. to multiply that by the number of minutes. Another example, but that these are just uh, uh, again to be seen as uh, as examples. Uh, uh, an optical sorting machine. So this is a, a highly technical and complex equipment that takes pictures of every single grain flowing down the uh, uh, this equipment uh, up to about 15 tons per hour of grains. Uh, imagine the number of pictures that are taken. Ooh. We make uh, an assessment with advanced algorithm of image processing, and we are able to sort the grains depending on their size, their color, their shape, wow. Uh, wow. but also their content in terms of protein, for instance. Um, oh, no. So this is a fantastic tool in order to avoid waste, for instance, uh, when producing. and um, Typically, uh, for uh, a use in the context of processing of grains, we can, with the use of those technologies, uh, l divide by half the, the, the waste which is generated in a, in a factory. Wow. So in a lot of tons per year of CO2 savings. That is so impressive. And when I hear that a machine can take, did you say 15 tons? 15 pictures tons. of 15 tons of grains an hour? 
Yeah, 15 tons an hour of grain. I let you do the math, but uh, it's, uh, okay. it's a lot of billions of grains. Okay. We take pictures of those grains. Um, it's a bit of a boring uh, job for these cameras, but uh, uh, that's, that's what they do. And, uh, and we sort uh, these grains according to different uh, attributes that we can derive from these pictures. Okay, so what this tells me is that humanity is smart enough to figure out cleaning up the supply chain. Because if we can take pictures of 15, 15 billion grains an hour to figure out each grain's weight, size, uh, protein level, then, you know, we can figure out the supply chain um, issues. Little note here for those on audio, uh, nice picture of the UN sustainability goals in the bottom right hand corner of this, just showing how much food, primarily food, but also uh, Bueller works in other areas, but food and materials, let's say, impacting the United Nations development goals. Of course, we've got life on land, life on water, uh, famine, um, um, climate change, uh, deforestation, biodiversity, uh, job opportunity. I talk a lot on VegTech Invest. Real wealth is created when you overhaul a system and you um, have mass adoption of that new system globally around the world. All people, young, old, religious, non-religious, educated, non-religious, and everyone adopts new way of doing things, which is what we're doing here in food industry. We're all going to adopt new ways of making food. We're still going to have meat. We can talk about cultivated meat if we have time. We're still going to have meat, but how we make it is just not going to be as wasteful as we do today. Okay, moving to the next slide. Indeed. So, um, in order to do all what we what we talked about, we we had to deploy a, a fair amount of uh, understanding of how these uh, value chain work and where the technology play, etc. And we did that for our own use, if I can say, in order to be able to come up with new technologies for our customers. But it was for us to understand, and we figure out that actually this approach can be used by our customers as well. So we decided to start a service. Uh, which we call the Environmental Impact Service, um, which we offer to our customers in order to do that, even if they don't have any builder equipment. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's that's important. In the end, we need all to uh, join our forces in order to tackle this immense problem that we have on the plate. But if and, they don't uh, have builder equipment, then they're not a builder customer. They might be partially, but we have provided services like this to uh, okay. organizations who don't necessarily have uh, these, uh, these these full lines equipped with us. So uh, we were able to measure uh, the, the footprint according to the model, to the, to the greenhouse gas protocol. We can go down to the technology unit and tell, okay, uh, this equipment here produces that much and has so much water exposure, and et cetera. Um, and measuring and putting numbers on, on this uh, uh, framework is super important because then it allows to make the choice of uh, do I go for green electricity or do I put some solar panels on the roof? Uh, mm -hmm. Should I reconsider my supply chain? Should I maybe change uh, the type of uh, transportation that we have? It's easy to make uh, such decisions and show them off when you don't have the numbers, but when you have the numbers, you can actually see the impact and work towards that impact and also plan longer term. So we've been quite successful in, in launching this. That's a, that's a team that is running this from Switzerland at the moment, but we have uh, references all around the world in different uh, uh, sectors. More than happy to share them offline. Uh, and uh, this is very much helping, we believe, this industry to uh, have a much better control on, on what we talk about here, which is lowering these uh, 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 these greenhouse gases, especially in scope three. Yeah, I think this is meaningful because you just can't make any real kind of decisions if you don't have the data. So really data first, and you can. that's why we're diving in on kind of an unusual plant-based business hour to take us through a slide presentation, which we usually don't do, but I want startups who have this opportunity to get it right from the beginning. I want them to understand um, what level of detail can actually happen uh, to figure out the supply chain and your emissions therein. Okay, I think this may be our last slide or close to last slide. Yeah, that, that, that's just basically wrapping up. These, these are examples of numbers that we can uh, we can reach in the different uh, areas. I don't want to repeat that, but uh, yeah. there are uh, when we when we talk, for instance, ninety percent less food 
losses with optical sorting. And we're not talking about one or two percent uh, making it better, right? It's 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 massive. Um, it's less massive. gas used and uh, uh, in, in particular noxious gas gases emitted uh, mm -hmm. in specific ovens. Uh, energy used in uh, roasting and so on and so forth. So we we cover pretty much any plant-based uh, value chain, and we have really now opportunities to know how and where to to make them uh, uh, better and 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 more efficient. So mm -hmm. these numbers are just illustration. Uh, more than happy to take in, in more details offline again. Yeah, it's really great. Um, I want to really thank you for doing this, and I'll quickly just show the the first slide. Um, that I wanted to mention something that I, I didn't know if I could interrupt you, but really I think the most dynamic conversations are when we go back and forth. So I, I did ask you to um, unceremoniously, let's say, go through the deck, but I wanted to be there kind of having a conversation back and forth. I love this. Now that we've talked about the details, we've gone, gone really specific. I take a bird's eye view again. We're really talking about using our natural resources in a better, smarter, more efficient way because we're getting more people, but we're not getting more natural resources. So we're smarter about what we have for both humanity and our economy. Now, I'll just because it's meaningful to me, I'll make a note that Jane Goodall actually says something quite similar. It's very um, inspiring for me to see when business and um, maybe nature can understand each other at the very least. And she has a triangle that is um, the planet, animals, and people. So if you combine animal and the planet together under one thing here, nature, you see that Bueller saying something quite similar as um, animals, planet, nature, humanity, and the economy. So I'll, I'll stop sharing the slide now and maybe we can focus on the economy together. Um, how do you see cleaning up the supply chain being better for the Bueller bottom line? Oh, uh, what is good for the Bueller bottom line is actually a reflection of what is good for the Bueller bottom, uh, for the, for the bottom line of our customers. Mm. Um, so the, 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 the number one benefit for our customers when they go under uh, such a, a, an approach, the first, it seems obvious, but it has to be said, it's, it's, uh, it's reduced costs. Um, if they can know where to put their attention, where they place attention with regards to energy usage, where they need to uh, increase the yield with a new piece of equipment for instance um, this is just money in the in the pocket this is this is very much directly having an impact on the bottom line you know it's strange to me that because I don't particularly in food and I guess it comes from being subsidized so you don't have to be as efficient as you could be but the cost of goods sold really is very inefficient there's so many areas to save money and when we're looking at the scale of feeding the world there's that means huge opportunity to make money because of the scale so these aren't small bits of money that could be saved why do you think it's taken us so long i think it's uh it, we we need to be also a little bit indulgent with ourselves in the sense that we understand these questions globally only since a few years um, we've been talking about being more efficient and being more environmental friendly, and but um, we the greenhouse gas protocol is relatively young. It's a tool that is in our hands uh, only since a few years, um, and uh, and it's a matter of communicating. and And, and thankfully, we have uh, places like like the one you you're running here, which is helping hopefully to uh, to promote these ideas. But we need just to explain, uh, make sure that we have easy models to work with that are understandable, that we can have a lever on. And, uh, and, and this is uh, a method that needs to be developed. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic, as you very rightly said, we have the tools, we have the technologies, we have everything in our hands. Now we start to have a global understanding. It's a matter of adoption and we will make it. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. We will make it. Um, I'll, I'll share some statistics. 
32% of the world's global methane comes from animal factories. 41% of the world's tropical deforestation is due to animal factories grazing and raising crops for animals. And 42% of the world's clean water is used in um, animal factories. Now, of course, that water can be repurposed, if you will. So it's used, it goes into the ground and you will get some of it back through rain, et cetera. But 42% we see when we're having droughts all over the United States and herds of cows are dying, et cetera. Uh, you see Arizona and Colorado fighting for water, these kinds of things happening. You see yeah. that, you know, water's at a premium and we aren't getting more land and we aren't getting more water. So these are things, necessity is the mother of an invention, as they say. So whether or not we figured it out before perhaps is irrelevant, but we're going to figure it out now. And I don't know that we have a choice. So uh, we're doing that. Um, Chile, I want to thank you for being with us. Let me repeat that anybody who's listening on audio, and if you want this deck, just come find me personally on LinkedIn, Elizabeth Alfano or Tilly. Can I send people to you on LinkedIn? Absolutely. More than happy to engage with anybody that tackles these questions. Thierry Duvanel, D-U-V-A-N-E-L, Director of Innovation at Bueller. Uh, and of course, you can just share this interview with your friends as well so that they can see the deck and our comments. I want to thank you, Thierry, for being with me. Before I let you go, I have two really quickie questions. If you're having a bad day and things aren't shaking out like you would like, what do you tell yourself to get yourself back in the groove? Oh, <laughs> um, I think of my children. I think that uh, we... Uh, we need to leave them a, a world in a, in the shape where they have hope for the future, where they can actually uh, live together with the 10 billion people that they will be living in in the world. And uh, we need to work on that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we will. And uh, this is just give me, giving me a little bit of a kick to, uh, to move forward. That's real inspiration for sure. Okay, same day. Things aren't going your way. So you're super busy. You're running around and you don't have time for lunch. What is your favorite plant-based snack? Oh, <laughs> um, usually the the uh, the veggies or anything that uh, we have cooked the day before, and I use as a as a quick lunch. Uh, but uh, I I I follow the uh, very old tradition of eating an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Um, that's my recipe. Well, good for you. I love that uh, apples and peanut butter. By the way, one of my very favorite snacks ever, and I go. Chunky peanut butter, everybody. Ooh, Chunky peanut great. butter. Thierry Duanel, Director of Innovation at Bueller. I want to thank you for being so patient with me. We had to switch some times around. This week has gotten crazy. But your knowledge drop that we do today on the Plant-Based Business Hour is really the reason that I do this show. I'm hoping to help entrepreneurs so that they can realize it can be tackled. It isn't overwhelming. You can dive deep in the numbers. And if you don't feel that you can do it yourself, reach out to Thierry and who knows, you know, be part of the mass challenge. And, and maybe there's things you can learn there. And hopefully you're starting to learn here with the plant-based business hour. So Thierry, again, thank you. You thank stay you. put, please don't go away. Everybody else on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. I will indeed see you next week on Tuesday from the good food conference. See everybody then. Bye folks.